Vitali will take the first five minutes to deploy a projector app. He already tested it. If at first you don't succeed, Vitali Wokin, please give him a weekend. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Vitaly Wochmin, and I'm a software engineer at CloudLog. Uh, but in my spare time, I like, I like to hack things together and to, to try new technologies, to, to build some applications. And I really love Docker for this. So I like to Dockerize my applications. And at some point of time, you usually will, well, you usually want to deploy your application somewhere. And Docker, it's not only about Docker engine, it's not only about running the, the containers. Docker also comes with a bunch of few nice and handy tools. For example, Docker Compose, where you can declare your, define your application in a simple YML file. Uh, like <coughs> there is a database, that there is a Redis, there is my application, and they just, runs all these services. One, another handy tool is a Docker machine. So Docker, Docker machine is an interesting tool to orchestrate, uh, to, for orchestration and managing uh, your nodes. So it can also, it, it can create uh, Amazon EC2 instances, it can create DigitalOcean, droplets, virtual box, uh, machines, and so on. Uh, but what do you do next? So when you create a new instance, you usually want to provision it somehow, like install some tools like HTOP or something. You may also want to, uh, for example, configure your firewall. And th there is a handy technology for this, it's called cloud init. And in the documentation they say that cloud init is a de facto multi-distribution package that handles early initialization of cloud instance. Well, I never heard about that tool until yesterday. Anyways, uh, cloud init allows you to define a simple cloud config final file where you say, okay, I want to install the HTOP, I want to, to upload this script and de execute that script. I, I, I want to, it allows you to add users to the system, uh, to add groups, to define which users uh, are participants of which groups and stuff like that. So, and the only thing that, that you need, uh, the, the only thing that is left is to create, for example, DigitalOcean uh, droplet with a Docker machine and say, okay, use my cloud config YML file to provision the instance. And that's all. In a couple of minutes, you have a brand new shiny droplet with everything installed, with everything configured. And all is left is to run your application with the Docker Compose. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. We need Jeremy to set up. How did you like today's lunch? I really liked. It was Pinchos, oh, oh, and okay. I think it was scalable microfood, <laughs> which we could all see because we had zero food cues to do the scheduling. <laughs> Very good. Still setting up. Uh, so if at first you don't succeed, skydiving is not for you. <laughs> also, lightning talks is not for you today because we have to be very quick and very thorough with the projector. So give a big hand to Jenny. <laughs> so hi again. Uh, first of all, my name is Jenny Makushek. It's not that hard, Co come on. Um, so yeah. Um, a couple of months ago, I was working on a Google project, and being a Google repository, you of course want to make everything uh, right the first time. Um, there was a lot of things going on, and as a team, we learned uh, really a lot. 
but um, today I, I wanted to share one of my frustrations with the Selenium environment, uh, the commu community, not only the Python community, but also the uh, Java community, and uh, what I'm trying to do about it. Uh, sorry, okay. So um, as someone that is, uh, okay, so the task was to uh, write end-to-end uh, -end tests, and Selenium seemed like a good tool for that. Uh, and um, when you're writing tests, there are a lot of different problems you have to solve. And one of them is that things are changing all of the time. Um, so there are cases where your front-end engineer is changing uh, uh, um, a component for various reasons. And of course, uh, the, once it is changed, the test will fail, and because the tests are failing, you can't merge things and so on. Um, and there are a lot of different problems uh, or other problems that you have also, uh, that you have to solve. Uh, for example, um, single page applications are popular lately, so uh, you have to model that somehow. Uh, there are good practices like page uh, object models and so on. Uh, and yeah, uh, once you get all that knowledge and you know the uh, good patterns, there are still uh, <coughs> exciting acrobatics you have to master. Um, and there are funny things to model like infinite lists. Uh, here's an example. Um, yeah. And of course, uh, what uh, will you do if the application is flaky? Uh, will you measure that? Will you ignore that? So, yeah. And once you get to model the page, you have to, of course, uh, structure the test as good as possible. And one of the steps are to model the elements themselves. And on the left side are the examples, and on the right side is the code. Uh, that actually works. Um, so you start with simple things like that, but the problem with that is that you can't find uh, reusable components on the web anywhere. At least I didn't find it. So I started to write a library and I'm planning to publish it. Um, and so as said, simple things like that uh, are not a, not a big problem, although they take like half an hour to implement, but uh, it gets interesting. So um, imagine you have to model like um, a text box where you have to filter a string and uh, you have auto completion and um, you have to, once you uh, enter the string, you have to uh, select uh, one of the members. Uh, not so trivial anymore. Uh, and it gets f uh, more interesting. So here you have a rich text editor because why not? Um, and here you actually have to play with uh, iframes, uh, which is pretty interesting with Selenium. Um, yeah, so you end up with uh, models like that. Here uh, on the left side is a model for date picker, which depending on uh, your front end uh, engineer, who is using either um, material UI or React components or uh, whatever, might be trivial to implement or not. But in any case, you have to do it uh, because uh, there isn't a library for models um, anywhere. Um, yeah, so a bit more things. Um, so to, uh, some of the uh, models require really uh, a lot of logic. For example, uh, you can select something only when it is click clickable, when Selenium signal uh, gives a signal that you can actually, or the user can actually click on it. So you end up not only with uh, a library for models, but also for uh, interesting uh, acrobatics with Selenium. Um, this one in particular uh, is very useful, uh, useful, and it took really some time to get to this solution. Okay, five more seconds. So that's the future where we want to go, have models for all the things, and here it will be um, published. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> David Terry and Anya, could you please connect with Fakunda and also Anton Lokeres about PyCon DE? All David, go connect. 
uh, connect with him so that you can put the presentation on one laptop. We have uh, PyCon Poland, we have PyCon Germany. Terry, set up. <laughs> He's going back and back. Go up, do it. Do you know Rick Astley has a very good collection of Pixar movies and he's very generous in lending them, except one. He will never give you up. Okay. Hey. Model-based testing with Kraftwerker. David Terry, yep. big hand. Hey, so my name is David, and I'm going to talk about the model-based testing. Um, one of the challenges for me when I'm testing an application is that as the number of potential states in the system increases, the number of paths that a user can take through this application increases in a kind of like really fast way, exponential or something. So it's not really feasible to write handcrafted tests for every one of those paths, but what you can do is you can model the system or more realistically like a component in the system as a graph or a finite state machine and then you just generate your tests by walking over that graph with some, until some kind of end, end condition is reached. Um, this means that the tests are more declarative, like you are just defining um, what should be tested rather than the actual mechanics of testing it. Um, the tests are less coupled to the application code, so if you change a state or some other bit of your application, you just need to change the tests in one or two places rather than lots. And if you walk over the graph in a random way, you can actually find new bugs with your tests, which I think is pretty cool. Um, but it also does mean the tests are not necessarily always the same. So to demonstrate this, I made here a little kind of test app. It's got a login page. You can do a good login, you can log out, a bad one, and then from there, you can log in again. Yeah. Um, so then this, if it's modeled as a graph, looks like this. You have your nodes, which are the states that need to be verified. The first page, the error page, and the logged in page. And then all of the edges are the actions to move between these states. So GraphWalker is actually a Java library, sorry, um, but you can combine it with Selenium and it's still pretty practical, I think. And also I just like the idea. So um, yeah, you model your graph, as a graph ML file, model, yeah, a graph ML file, and then GraphWorker will take this and it will generate an uh, interface for you to use, which, hmm, it's crashed, okay. Which looks like this. You have um, just a method for every edge and a method for every vertex. And then when you want, you can see it here. When you want to write, the tests, you just override each of these methods. So here, this is just Selenium code for selecting an element and clicking on it, and down here, um, selecting an element and asserting that the text is um, a certain value. And then, when you run the tests, it looks like this. So 100% edges, 100% vertexes. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Rafael, please consider to scale up here. Uh, where is Team Koala? Is Team Koala near enough? OK. Be prepared to scale after Rafael. Yes, am I. And oh, wow. Oh, wonderful, it's already there. Yep. Excellent, give a big hand to Raphael. Huh. But considerations at scale. Dobry wieczór. So, a lot of breath has been spent at this, conversa at this conference talking a lot about technologies where you have active compute going over your data, all of the web technologies. But what happens when your data is too big for that? I'm talking about after Spark has fallen over, which it did at about 10% of our daily volume. Uh, at that point, you're dealing with petabytes of data, you're dealing with hundreds of users accessing your data in a very, very, very concurrent fashion. So how should you tailor your access patterns so that you don't fuck it over for everyone else? Um, 
Based on some work by Robert Grossman at the University of Chicago, we've come up with a basic idea of what a scalable algorithm looks like. If you have X amount of data and you have X amount of compute resources, it should take that much time. But if you double your data and double your compute resources, time should be invariant. That is a data scale. That is a data scalable algorithm. It will work over any size of data. If the amount of time goes up, you should refactor your algorithm or buy a Cray. And if the time goes down, I really wonder what you're doing. Now, scheduling the work. If you're, do if you're working with large scale clusters like at the national labs or at big companies, you often have a scheduler to help spread the load over thousands of PCs. And when you're working with those, there are a few things you should do to be a nice person. First of all, if the time that your job takes is less than the time it takes to schedule your job, you are doing something wrong. Uh, I cannot express to you how many times I see people who have jobs that run at a tenth of a second, and yet it takes two tenths of a second to schedule the job. If you are never actually filling any of your nodes, you should think about batching things differently. Speaking of batching, most scheduling systems offer ways to take several jobs that are the same type with slightly different input parameters and simply pass in the job once and then an array or whatever else to pass into the job many, many, many times for all of its instances. This will reduce scheduler overhead. Also, don't fill the queue. The queue is not a storage place for all the work you ever intend to do. Uh, you can knock over schedulers. I don't care how, bil how big you build your box. A million jobs is still a million jobs over your 10,000 slots. It's a lot of work. If you want to be really sexy, you can use something like DRMAA, or pronounced drama, to uh, programmatically do all of this. I have a quote. Makes this presentation feel deeper. <laughs> now. Scaling data. Uh, your approaches to data, it's nice when you have tons and tons of salary workers doing little things against your live active databases when, no offense, Hotjar, but you know, when you're at Hotjar size data, uh, just because you guys decide to publish how much data you have. Now, when you're working with far larger amounts of data, remember that it is always faster to go across the network than it is to go to disk. I don't care if it's local disk. Now, we're scaling in kind of the inverse of TV. TV, we already have 4K televisions, and maybe next year we'll have some bloody 4K content. But for now, we already have tons of people promising the world to every single investor about big data, and uh, maybe next year we'll have the kind of compute that can make you run Redis at five petabytes. But until we do, remember, you're gonna be using a file system. And when you use file systems, you wanna be moving data and not metadata. Sorry, Hansel dude, that's not gonna work at scale. And so, when you do this, you will fuck yourself over on metadata operations. There's no way GPFS scales this. You can try this with object stores, but you're just moving stuff that doesn't matter to what you actually want to be doing. Please, use a packaging format, use HDF5, use something where you're going to be having fewer metadata operations in comparison to the amount of data you're moving. Don't put your logic in your metadata. Lastly, think about how you're doing concurrent or coalescing your I.O. You can read, read into RAM somewhere on the network, push it around, do the work with MPI ranks, great way to do this. Um, other sorts of multiprocessing, there's all sorts of ways to do this. Um, we did find that when we tried to run with all of our data at scale over Spark, 95% of it was pickling. There are better ways to do that, but you know, figure out what works well for your data, and then bring it all back and write it once. That way, you coalesce I.O., you use I.O. that is large enough to make sense. Most, blo most blocks on devices are four megs, so if you're doing four kilobyte I.O., yeah, think about it. And uh, you will be a much better grid user. So, thank you very much. I'm 27, I started on Fortran, and it's great to be on Python. Very good. <coughs> Team Qua. Thank you very much, Raphael. Our next speaker will be Team Koala. Please set up. Um, we have three Please conference announcements here. Uh, Anya, Anton, and Fasunda. So we blocked you, clustered you together, and you'll get six minutes. You can fight with each other from, who from will get device. how many minutes. I was told on the Telegram channel that was possible. What? You want sound. Sound. Uh, there is a plug-in for sound if you still have this. Yeah, I have it. Thanks. Very good. That will be harder if it's cancel and we have to go via USB-C. Oh, we can't hear anything, though. Oh, thanks. All right, then okay. I'm ready.
You good? Okay. So, give a hand to Team Kiala. Koala. All right. So, we actually had somebody setting up at 7 to deliver this lightning talk to you. So, this one is about crazy ideas, about those kinds of ideas where everybody is against it, but because it just seems not realistic, such as developers doing marketing. So yesterday evening at 9 p.m., we had such an idea, and everybody was against it. But we did it without any experience, without any equipment, and without time. And actually, this was also how the Koala project started. So when you have such an idea, try to do it. And here's what we did just to prove the point. And because it's awesome. Coding style was really bad. Uh, and when I say bad, I mean like really bad. Well, I guess at some point you just couldn't stand it anymore. Oh, fuck it! Yeah, he was really pissed. But little did he know, but we were working on a tool that would change his life forever. <laughs> was able to take on the wall to the box. Chips. <coughs> I don't know where you are. I don't know why you're here. I can tell you, I don't have a lot of patience, but what I do have are a particular set of tools. Tools I've acquired over a large number of comments. Tools that make me a nightmare for a box like you. I will look for you, I will find you, and I will fix you. Thank you very much. Are you please turn up the sound, turn off the sound, turn up the beat. Please, the three, and I will set uh, up the timer to six minutes. No. What? Why eight? Yes, yeah, three times two is six. Three is nine. We, we have three times two. We have two minutes per conference. And we have Armin Rigo, who has a doctorate I'm not talking in. About a conference. Huh? I'm not talking about the conference. PyCon Argentina? No, no. Python Argentina, Falcunda Padista? Python Argentina. No, ah, Python. Python. Wonderful. So you indeed have nine minutes. <laughs> Excellent. Falcunda <laughs> Padista, Python Argentina. I go first. <laughs> and he cheated. Now it's. Pi okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give a big hand to Fasunda. <laughs> hola, hola. This is working, it's not working. Hola, yeah. Hola. So, Python Argentina. Right. So, we, I, we presented part of these previous years. We, you kind of know what we do. We just co try to communicate everybody in the country to be the central point of reference. Everybody trying to find what Python is, try to contact other Python developers to have code peers or to hire people or to sue people or whatever. I mean, this is, if you pronounce Python in Argentina, the idea is for you to find that what you need. So 
We have a big community. We say that in Argentina, Python is about the people. We have a mailing list with a lot of people that luckily doesn't have, have a very good nice, uh, noise information ratio. We have a, a channel in Freenode that we call the channel of love, not because we are kind, we are kind people, but also because PR in indie means love, so th that gives us funny situations. We have a, a web portal with the standard things, show board, etc., and we have the official tutorials for Python 2.7, 3.5, and Django translated to Spanish, published in HTML, PDF, and some, uh, sometimes we print them to, to distribute to people, which is very nice. So some words about last big events we had. We have a PyCon last year. It was our seventh. This is a standard conference. People watching, people talking, people talking, people talking, people in the high, in the halls. We also have a PyCamp. This is more fun. It's, we have this ninth this year. This is for a lot of well, kind of 30 people going to somewhere just to code for four days, code, 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 people coding, people coding, people designing stuff, people talking about the design, people also having meetings. We have Python Argentina meetings there with, of course, wine, and with, of course, asado, people lunching together. That's a pick camp. Nice ways, nice places to take a walk. And of course, learning how to fight r for real. <laughs> what we will do next? Well, we have a PyCon Argentina this year in November in Bahia Blanca. It's a very nice place. You can go if you if you have a Span if you know Spanish, you will enjoy it a lot. If you don't know Spanish, you will learn. So. We will have a Pi Camp next year. We still didn't planify, but it's one of the best events of the year, so we will have a Pi Camp. And we are finishing in the following months uh, the nonprofit, so we will become an official legal entity that the idea is just to help the community to uh, handle money, etc., etc., etc. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sunda. PyCon DE, so, please. Um, oh, oh, PyCon Poland. <laughs> okay, now Anya will talk about PyCon Poland, and I will get down the time to two minutes. Okay. Give a big hand. Hi, I'm here on behalf of organizers, and I wanted to um, tell you that PyCon Poland is actually the fourth um, oldest PyCon in Europe. And there are plenty of attendees coming, uh, already a lot of them registered from all around Europe. And uh, it's so cool that even Europe Python, Lightnap is so cool that even Europe Python uh, follows that. And it happens in mid-October in Osa near Warsaw. Uh, it's, uh, everyone is, um, gets an accommodation in the same hotel, uh, surrounded by forest. It's really lovely there, but worry not about getting there because there are going to be conference bus transfers from Warsaw, so only worry about getting to Warsaw, which is not that hard, I guess. Uh, there are five trucks, at least half of them are in English, so um, you're gonna understand most of it, I guess. Um, there are plenty of other activities, including coding challenge that finishes in early morning hours. <laughs> we play board games, um, we have like amazing um, live music even. Um, hotel offers a lot of attractions itself, we also have social dinners, look lovely. Um, these are the current prices. Um, we also are gonna have a beginner's workshop uh, where we're looking for sponsors, especially participants and mentors. Go to the website, check it out if you're interested. Um, if you have any questions, these are, this is the list of ambassadors. You can always ask for details, but also visit our website, plpycon.org, for more information. Thank you. Wonderful! Excellent. One minute and 30 seconds. That's a new record for a conference announcement. Great. Now the Germans will prove that they're even more efficient. Anton. Hi, everyone. 
Hi guys. It's really great to see you here. Thanks for making it through the five days of intense talks and still attending this one. I will not take much of your time. I'll have another record on the lighting talks, I hope. So as you might guess already, I'm here to bring one more awesome event to the Python universe. It's PyCon DE. And uh, it will be held on the last uh, weekend of October. It's uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Friday would be a workshop day and sprint day, and Saturday, Sunday would be talks. We'll have three tracks. We'll have a German track, English track, and we're working on a business track. Obviously, it's German and it's Bavaria, so everyone is invited for some good beer, good quality talks, some sharing of the engineering power, and of course, of developing Python. So guys, uh, I guess I would contribute the uh, last few seconds to just uh, reminding that our community is awesome, generally. You see this conference, how well it's organized. It sets quite high standards for doing other conferences, so we are kind of under pressure now. But I think my last five seconds was a bit of applause for EuroPython organizers. <laughs> German efficiency, done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anton. Now I need Shai Efrati. Shai? You're here? Please set up. On the other hand, you have different fingers. <laughs> Took a time. So, I wanted to use a moment when somebody is struggling with his laptop to talk about offense. There was an English philosopher Jimmy Carr, <laughs> he said, offense can't be given, it can only be taken. So, <clears throat> give a big hand to the Creator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I'm Shai, and I'm from Israel, so we don't say Creator, we say Creator. Um, <laughs> and I'm actually not showing my own project, I'm showing uh, Tom's project, with, which is a friend and a colleague. And um, this project is already live, and I will start talking about it now. So, GitHub Stars, um, do you use it? Yes, do you use it. Do you use it for bookmarks, or do you use it to show appreciation to other people? Both. Okay, but are they useful as a measurement tool for uh, other people's projects, if they are good or not? Yes? I don't know. Okay, so I had a discussion with Tom. This is Tom. And I had a discussion with him, and I asked him, how come Meteor has more stars than uh, Django, or Flask more than Django? Like, what kind of measurement tool is it? And we asked uh, Mayer, which is this guy, and Mayer is a really professional uh, developer at our company, and he said, I don't use stars at all. And we asked him, so what do you use? And he said, I use uh, pull requests, and I use GitHub issues. And they use, um, uh, yeah, a number of commits, a number of contributors. So, yeah, just do that. So, okay, Git GitHub trending. Okay, GitHub trending. We all know that. We all know it. And we saw the stars, and it's only rank ranked by the stars. And it's not a good uh, way of measuring uh, project uh, quality. So Tom created this project, which is called the Krichelinator. And the Krichelinator is measuring uh, projects by their um, uh, like real quality, like number of contributors, number of commits, number of uh, merged pull requests, uh, proposed pull requests, closed issues, and known, uh, new issues. Sorry. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it is written in Elixir and not in Python, because uh, he really likes to learn new technologies. If you want to know how the measurements is being, is being done right now, so these are the factors. It's a bit random. We might change it in the future. If you have any uh, uh, suggestions, you can put it on the GitHub uh, uh, project, which is here. And, opa, sorry, yeah. So about the technology of the project, it's uh, scraping the uh, GitHub uh, website Every six hours, it takes um, a random project and it con compares them to the 500 uh, good projects that are already in the database. And if they are better, it replaces them. And 
there are uh, 16 scrapers that are doing the job. Because it's Elixir, it, it uses the like, uh, high, efficiency of, high efficiency of the language. And actually, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shai. Lars Clausen. Lars? You're already up here. That, that's good. That's excellent. So if he's already up here, I need, oh, you, you renumbered. Does anybody remember the command renumber? Nobody developed on Commodore 64. Anyway, Lars Clausen about live hydrological modeling with 3D I. Give him the hand. Hi guys, I talked to a couple of people the last days and uh, what I do, or what I've been doing for the last uh, one and a half years and they encouraged me to give a lightning talk because they thought it was interesting and I thought I'd give it a shot. So now I'm here, terrified. Um, anyway, I'm going to uh, talk about live hydrologi hydrological modeling. I work for a small consulting firm in the Netherlands. It's called Nederlands Schurmans. I put the name up there so you can actually understand what I just said. <laughs> um, and I'm going to give you a quick uh, live demo. So this is uh, uh, our application. And it allows you, well, maybe I have to go back quickly and tell you what hydrological modeling is uh, anyway. Huh? So I try to make it real quick. It's a mathematical uh, model of uh, physical forces that affect uh, water and how it flows. And we use it uh, basically for predictions. So, but the cool thing is you can start your own simulation, but you can also uh, follow along a simulation that has already been started. So in this case, I asked my colleague Martijn to, uh, to run a simulation. So uh, this is based on, uh, basically on Redis uh, pops up uh, mechanism. And all the action he's taking, um, well, are also um, yeah, uh, communicated into my direction. So you can see he's interacting with the map. I just can follow along. Uh, I, can't, I don't have any powers to do actions myself. So you can unfollow, you come back to this screen, you can start your own session. So I'm gonna start this model. It's gonna take a while because uh, I'm gonna um, show you some main components of the application. We uh, have a service, service it's called Impy, and uh, it um, converts basically a spatial light database file and some raster files into files the calculation core understands. So what's the calculation core? That's where the um, actual uh, uh, calculation is done. So it's called 3DI core and it's written in Fortran. So I think today is a good day to give this presentation anyway because uh, of the talk keynote uh, this morning because well, our application actually is a case where web development and uh, uh, scientific um, coding comes together. So uh, we have a machine manager. I just, when I uh, started a simulation, I did a call to the machine manager and uh, that service is responsible for starting, killing and running Docker containers. So we also have a socket server for more static content and we have the Docker container that, um, yeah, that has, uh, that is an isolated environment for the calculation core, actually. We also have a web map server that serves all the, um, all the, um, well, the, 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 the web map um, layers, like rasters and vector data. And all in Python, of course not, but uh, first, um, let me uh, first give you, um, see, give you impression like what you can do. Because on the background, well, with the play button, you can start the simulation. So you see uh, some elements uh, start to respond to it. You see uh, pumps that are pumping water through the system. You see water flowing that are the little uh, uh, balls. But you can also interactively uh, influence the modeling. So you can, for example, 
uh, put some constant rain intensity onto you into the simulation. You can ask for uh, historical data, and uh, well, we have some predefined uh, rain um, events that occur so and so often within, I don't know, a period of time. And that is being translated live uh, into a NumPy array, which is then passed on to the calculation core that does all the equations. Um, well, it's not all of Python, but our stack is, uh, well, consists, it's, an, it's not complete, but we use a lot of Django, GeoDjango, uh, ZMQ, Redis, um, for caching and the pops up, uh, Angular and Leaflet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. I need Leonardo Santagada to come on the stage real quick. I need the lady or the man who proposed to talk about how to scale Python for Excel users and who can't afford a name to come to the stage to be prepared. I need Hugo. Hertha, you, was it you with the Excel users? Mm -hmm. Excellent, that's Fabio. And oh, Hugo Hertha, just as a backup. Where is Hugo? Okay, be prepared after Fabio. Maybe we can get you. So, give a big hand to Leonardo about... Uh, it's about uh, Conch. The Conch, ah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll just get to that. So, someone told me it's better to have code on slide, so I did, uh, it's only cold now. <laughs> so for, I guess, 10, 20 years of my life, I've been doing Bash as my shell, and I've been quite happy, and then I'll be doing like this. I'm Santagada, that's my last name, and then I see this kind of code, and I have to fix it, and then I get crazy, and I say, no, let's do something better. So let me get out of this. Okay, so I switched to Z shell, which is much, much better. Uh, and oh my Z shell, if you're still using it, it's good. Uh, it does a lot of things like a cool prompt. If I go to something like this, it'll show me some, some stuff. So that's good, but when I have to fix it and I have made patches for, for it, it's terrible again. And then I said, no, I need something better, so let me get out of this. And I moved to Fish. Fish is an amazing shell. Uh, yeah, it's going to get better, so don't, don't clap now. It's, it's even better. So Fish is nice, but I got tired of fixing the shell I'm in every time in a different syntax and with little different things. And I was like, no, I'm not fixing. So I went back to Z shell for a while, but now I got something better. So I'm like, ah, oh, oh, one of the nice things is that fish has live syntax highlighting. So you're typing this, it knows it's a command. And if you put an if, it'll know uh, a string, it knows it's a string. So nice, but nah. Okay. <laughs> so, conch is a very nice shell. I'll just show the website in a while. It's a very nice shell. It's all made in Python. Uh, it's amazing. It uses prompt toolkit that was presented before. So it does have live things. It is very nice to try to help you in everything that you do. And then I can show you. I started with, um, oh, this was supposed to be bigger, but it's fine. Uh, so. Now we are in Python land, which is awesome. So variables have types. Oh, that's so new. Uh, and you can uh, concatenate stuff and, and do all the kind of stuff you want to do but never could in shell. For example, uh, it's my first time I actually implemented something to go to, a, uh, to, go to my Go source directory into my projects. It's a very deep path if you know how this works. And I even did uh, autocomplete, which is completely crazy in anything besides uh, conch. So uh, finally, this works, and I'm happy. It's Python, so I don't have to learn a new language. Uh, the project is amazing. The people doing it are really nice. They, I already did like triple requests. They, they 
they actually actively told me to always be nice to other people when reviewing code and, and doing pull requests and everything else, which is really nice. So you see everyone is trying to help you to get your code in and not like every other uh, old shell project, so that's good. Installing it is quite easy, just pip3 installed. Uh, it's a Python 3 only thing, which is also good, I think. Uh, hopefully you also think that's good. Uh, so that's the website, uh, sean.sh, I guess. So you can go there, read more about it, see a little video about this, and, uh, and yes, it's very nice. I still have a minute, so let's see a little bit of people that actually know how to use it using it. Uh, <laughs> Um, so yeah, very nice. I hope you all switch to it, or and if anything bad uh, is still not happening on it, please report the bugs. We can try to fix it. Um, that's it. I, I hope you have fun and stop having terrible shell scripts everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please let off of you. I got a little feeling like Inception when he went out from one shell to outer shell to outer shell to outer shell. And I still fear we are living in some kind of shell. <laughs> Can somebody please exit? Now, give a big hand to Fabio about how to scale Python for Excel users. Cool. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about the project I'm recently working on. Um, so we saw Gao uh, keynote today, and uh, and in the data science world, um, there's one thing that struggles a lot of people, and it is uh, probably the most used um, tool for data science or everyday data science is actually Microsoft Excel. It's even my mother can do some stuff there. It actually has an. Uh, the right UI and, and the right, it's the right tool for those kind of problems, but it, it really doesn't scale for really interesting problems and really hard, uh, hard problems. So every time, um, how many people here work with related data science uh, or PyData tools and stuff? Not many. Um, how many here actually had someone asking them to, to use Excel files and run some Python code all over it? <laughs> okay, that's quite a lot. <laughs> Who here have heard about Jupyter Notebooks? <laughs> cool. So basically, um, that's the, one of the first things you say to someone using Excel, like try Jupyter Notebooks and you try to write some small piece of code and it, you, just, you just use some of the Python libraries that consume Excel and that's it. Well, that's not really the case because most of the time Excel users are not even f by far related to programming. That's really hard and there's a really hard learning cur curve for them. So in the ideal world, you have um, something like Jupyter and somehow installed and you, you would write something for them or they would just write themselves. So in this case, let's see, let's say I have a function that basically just Uses scikit-learn and uh, clustering algorithms to find uh, clusters, clusters in the data. Um, and since I'm uh, I'm writing this for my mom, um, I'm actually writing some nice documentation telling how to use it. Uh, sorry, how to use it and explain a little bit more. Um, so in an ideal world, um, we would have somehow um, a plugin. And they just could say, okay, let's use this thing. And it will load the, the notebooks I have uh, on some, somewhere. And I could consume it. But since Excel users, they don't have really nice, good feeling with, with code, we, you could present uh, and expose functions that are written the not the Jupyter Notebook to the Excel users. So in this case, I have two fun functions. The one I showed before is clustering. And it can, it can check documentation and see what, what I've written. It links to external links, so like 
You can check stuff here. Oh, nice, it uses clustering. Um, you can actually check and say, okay, let's let's try this thing with some Excel data here. And so let's say I have noisy circles here, all numbers, because we like numbers, right? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I have enough time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so say I want to take some data from Excel and say take selected data, call it circles, uh, cool, confirm. And then I say okay I will use, I want to use this clustering thing in, with circles and use mean shift algorithm. And very likely here I would tell just to use uh, run on change, so every time I, I change the interface, it runs again. And here you go. I can run. It executes, and it, this this runs clustering algorithms on a kernel, and then gets back the result. In this case, the result is actually a bokeh plot, because we like bokeh plots, right? <laughs> um, and I can change stuff. It will re-execute every time I change the, the data. Um, I can change and see. Okay. Let's use the blob that's nice as well. So I can add here cell blob value is from six three to G. I think it's this. Confirm new blob data. Since I I had to okay. And that's it. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> that sadly, sorry Hugo, uh, lets us run out of time for today's lightning talk. Thanks to all the speakers, thanks to the audience. Give you a big hand.